Cast is now starting. All attendees are in listen only mode. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar on Ep economic de development opportunities with local government legislation. We picked this topic um, because we had a lot of feedback that this was a, a gap in people's knowledge and they wanted to learn more about those opportunities that were hiding in their local government legislation. And because we thought it would be a great topic um, for Small Business Week, and it's Small Business Week in British Columbia right now, and you'll be hearing a lot about a, a, a benefit that um, you can utilize for your small businesses. Before we begin, I'll introduce myself. My name is Jessica Ritchie. I'm with the Regional Programs and Engagement Branch um, in the Ministry of Jobs, Trade and Technology. I'll be moderating the Q&A period and if you're experiencing any technical challenges, you can reach out to me and I'll help, try and help you resolve them. I'm located in Victoria, British Columbia on the unceded Coast Salish territory of Lola Kwangan people, known today as the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nation. And today we are going to um, hear from three different groups. First, we're going to hear from the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing, and they're going to be speaking specifically to local government legislation and some of the economic development opportunities in it. Second, we're going to hear from Gibson, the city of Gibson. Sorry, I can hear. Sorry, you just make sure you're all muted, all of our panelists. Sorry about that. We have Gibsons on the economic de development opportunities um, and successes that they've had through local government legislation and um, kind of show the tools that um, that uh, the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing have talked about and see and how they've been in action and benefiting their community. And then we're going to hear um, from the Small Business Roundtable about the Open for Business Award nomination process because nominations are now open and this is a great way that you can celebrate your community. But before we get into the webinar, I'm going to go over some housekeeping and then I'll introduce our speakers. So if you haven't used the GoToWebinar platform, there's just a couple things you should know. If you're experiencing audio issues, what I'd recommend is try using a, um, a phone. You can do that by just clicking the phone option. Uh, phone number will pop up with a pin specific to you and you'll be able to join the webinar that way. Uh, the second thing you should know, we are going to be pausing after each presentation to allow you to ask our panelists some questions. Um, please pop questions into the question box anytime you think of them. You don't have to wait till the question and answer period and I'll be asking our panelists that. If you have any um, if you have any issues throughout the webinar, you can also throw those in there and I can I can try and help you um, as our presenters are are speaking. Uh, if we don't get to a question that you've asked, we will try and follow up with you after the webinar via email. I would like to remind everyone as well that this session is being recorded. If you're, uh, if you know of someone that you think would benefit from the information that's being shared that wasn't able to attend, we'll be posting both the webinar recording as well as the slides from today at gov.bc.ca/economicdevelopment, and you'll be able to look under the economic development section, or sorry, the BC Ideas Exchange on our economic development page. So that's all the housekeeping that I have for today. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to my colleagues, Catherine Lee and Brent Mueller at the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing. So bear with us. We're just going to do a technical switch here and um, they're going to be presenting their material. Uh, uh, said, my name is Catherine Lee and I'm a senior program analyst with the Governance Relations Unit in the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing. And I'm here with my colleague, Brent Mueller, who is the Director of Governance Relations. Uh, next slide. And today we will be giving you a brief overview of what our area does within the Ministry. Main legislation that gives local governments their authority and guides their decision making. Uh, some of the legislative tools that local governments can use for economic development and some on the ground examples of local governments who are using these tools. And then lastly, we will look at the local government land use planning framework and how it can support uh, economic development. And next slide, please. So looking at our ministry's structure, the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing is made up of the local government division the Office of Housing and Construction Standards and Community and Legislative Services. And within the local government division is the governance and structure branch, which is where our unit governance relations sits. And we're responsible for encouraging relationships and agreements between local and First Nations governments 
and supporting local government's economic and social development through managing the ministry's sponsored Crown Grant program. We also support resort development and business improvement areas and help to ensure that local government interests are considered in environmental assessment processes. Can you change the slide, please? And so before we look at the tools and the legislation that enables the tools, I think it's helpful to understand that BC's local government system is based on the concepts of autonomy, empowerment and accountability and collaboration among local governments and with other forms and levels of government. So in the context of tools that can support businesses and economic development, this means that most of the tools are voluntary. So local governments can choose to use them or not based on local and regional priorities. And the ministry does not provide a lot of oversight for how local governments use these tools, and we, we do not question local government decision making. Next slide. <clears throat> so the main legislation that applies to local governments is the Community Charter and the Local Government Act. And the Community Charter gives municipalities broad powers to create services, enter into partnerships and create bodies such as corporations and commissions that can be used to support economic development and business promotion. And similarly, the Local Government Act gives regional, district board, uh, regional districts broad powers to create services, enter into partnerships and create bodies. And it also provides the framework for local and regional planning and other land use management tools, which Brent will touch on in just a little bit. Next slide, please. So as you can see, local governments have a number of tools. They can choose to support economic development in their communities. And we'll just go over each of these in a little bit more detail. And I will give some examples of how local governments are using these tools or how they can use them. Next slide, please. So the first tool is broad powers. Local governments have broad authority to provide any service that the council or board considers necessary or desirable. And they can do this uh, through partnerships with another local government, a private corporation, a not-for-profit organization, a First Nation, or a public authority such as a, a school board. Next slide, please. And they also have corporate powers and cost recovery powers. And these powers are similar for both municipalities and regional districts. Their corporate powers enable them to enter into agreements with other bodies, create corporations and societies, delegate their powers, duties and functions, for example, to a council or a board member or a committee or a commission. And they can also own and dispose of land and other assets. And they can also impose fees and charges for service provision and use of government property. And under the Community Charter, municipalities have uh, flexible authority to exercise regulatory powers in relation to a number of spheres, such as businesses and public places. And regional districts have um, a little bit more limited regulatory powers in municipalities. So, for example, unless specifically provided to them, regional districts generally do not have the authority to regulate businesses unless they are provided that authority through a provincial regulation. And next slide. And the Community Charter and Local Government Act prohibit local governments from assisting business. However, the legislation does allow local governments to provide assistance to business for the provision of services as long as there is a partnering agreement in place. Next slide, please. So looking at some of the partnering agreements that local governments can enter into with businesses, um, and I apologize for the text heavy slides here. Um, I'm not going to go over each point on the slides in each legislative reference, but I put that information in here in case people want to go back and look at the deck later or maybe look up something in the legislation. Um, my plan is more just to introduce each tool and then give an example of how it can be used on the ground. So don't be too daunted by, by a couple of these slides. Um, so looking at partnerships, municipalities and regional districts can enter into partnering agreements with businesses for the provision of a service on behalf of the municipality or regional district. So a common example of this is, is partnering with a business to deliver a garbage collection or a, a recycling service. And local governments can incur liabilities under an agreement so they can lease land, vehicles and equipment at favorable terms for a business to use for the provision of a service. So a regional district uh, could lease property necessary to stage a garbage collection service and the property could, could be used under agreement 
by, by the garbage collection business in the provision of the garbage collection service. Local governments can also guarantee repayment of the borrowing of a business. So to use the example of a garbage collection service again, if a local government wants to expand its garbage service under a partnering agreement, it can guarantee a loan for the garbage collection business to buy more trucks, for example. Um, local governments can also provide a tax exemption for properties used in relation to a service provided by a business under a partnering agreement. So for our garbage collection service, again, any property owned by the garbage collection business and used for the purposes of providing that garbage collection service may be eligible for a partnering tax exemption. Next slide, please. So um, municipalities can exempt specific properties from municipal property value taxes for up to 10 years in order to encourage economic, social, or environmental revitalization of an individual property or an area of, of the municipality. So for example, under an exemption agreement, council could provide tax exemptions to properties and businesses that agree to make exterior improvements in order to economically revitalize a, a derelict area. And next slide, please. And local governments can also create partnerships with First Nations via agreements to the economic benefit of both of the parties. So they can create agreements for service provision, operation and enforcement in relation to regulatory authority and management of property or an interest in property. Next slide. <clears throat> and so an example of this is agreements that the City of Pitt Meadows and the Catsey First Nation have with each other for the provision of water and sewer and fire protection services. And not only do both communities benefit from cost-effective service provision under these agreements, but in this case, the process of crafting these agreements um, strengthened relationships and built mutual trust between the city and the First Nation. Next slide. <clears throat> and so as I mentioned earlier, municipalities have broad powers to provide services, which includes services for the economic benefit of the community. And I, I think service delivery is an area that may get overlooked sometimes when thinking about economic development. Um, local governments are increasingly adopting specific economic development functions and programs but they also facilitate economic development through poor service delivery, like infrastructure provision for water and sewer and roads. And I, this is an important, and I think sometimes undervalued contribution that is essential for people to live and, and do business in a community. Next slide, please. So an example of a, a municipal service that more explicitly addresses economic development is a business improvement area which is a service established by council where business owners finance activities to promote business in the area. So uh, for example, they may um, finance activities like removing graffiti, conserving carriage property, um, holding events like in Victoria, they hold a, a car free day, uh, festivals and markets to, to encourage people to come into the area and, and, and frequent the businesses. Next slide. And there are over 60 business improvement areas in BC. And I have just uh, a snapshot of just a few of them here. Um, they're, they're spread all over. There are several in the Lower Mainland and on Vancouver Island, some in the Okanagan, uh, the Sunshine Coast, a couple in the Caribou, and then also a few further up north. So, so this is a fairly widely used tool by municipalities. Next slide, please. And so like municipalities, regional districts have broad powers to provide services and many regional districts have economic development services that fund economic development commissions and activities and projects that support local businesses and benefit the regional economy. And an example of this is the Central Okanagan Economic Development Commission. Uh, next slide. And this commission is a service of the Regional District of Central Okanagan which means it is funded by and accountable to the regional district. And the commission has a number of programs and that support existing businesses and encourage new business investment in the region. The next slide. So looking a little more closely at commissions, both municipalities and regional districts can create commissions through a commission establishment bylaw that delegates some of their decision-making authority to the commission and outlines the commission's um, purposes, 
um, such as, you know, it may be formed to operate in an economic development service or operate and maintain a, a performing arts center. And councils and boards will um, sometimes create commissions when they do not have the capacity to undertake an initiative directly or they feel that a delegated body could deliver a service more effectively due to their expertise. And next slide. <clears throat> Uh, so another type of body that municipalities and regional districts can create under the legislation is a corporation and they may choose to form a corporation to gain external expertise achieve economies of scale and in some cases a corporation can allow for shared control with other local governments and, and entities for a broader benefit next slide please so an example of a, of a shared control corporation model is the lower columbia initiatives corporation which is a partnership between the Columbia Basin Trust and the five easternmost municipalities and two electoral areas in the regional district of Kootenai Boundary. And one of the corporation's main activities is running investment attraction initiatives for the region, including an innovative marketing program called Metal Tech Alley, which many of you may have heard about. Um, Metal Tech Alley markets the region's assets to the high tech industry and as I understand it has been quite successful so far in attracting new companies to the region. Next slide please. And um, local governments can also create societies under the legislation. Societies um, are not-for-profit, non-taxable organizations that may or may not be incorporated under the Societies Act. And local governments can become a member of an existing society or they can incorporate their own. Next slide. And as an example of this, Emmanuel Machado from the town of Gibsons will talk to you in just a little bit about the Gibsons Community Building Society, which operates Gibsons public market facilities under a long-term lease agreement. Next slide, please. And getting into land use planning, I will, I'll hand the presentation over to Brent for that, who uh, will talk to you about how land use planning can be used for economic development. Hi, everybody. I think uh, you might need to be Sorry, everyone. Sorry. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm suffering with a little bit of a cold, so I um, apologize for that. Maybe just a bit of background. I'm, I'm public, been in the public service for about 25 years in my current role for about three years, um, working with Catherine on economic development and um, with another colleague, Diana Porter, on First Nation local government relations. Prior to that, I had about 15 years working on land use issues. Um, the interface between the Crown and um, the sort of the private built environment and on regional growth strategies. So that's why I'm going to give you a little bit of a background on land use planning. Um, similar to what Catherine said earlier, uh, in British Columbia, our system, and I don't know if there's any uh, practicing planners on the phone uh, who have dealt with this, and in particular if they work from other jurisdictions and come to British Columbia, um, high degree of local autonomy. We provide sort of an overall framework for growth and development. Um, creates a pathway, a pathway forward for investment. And I think, you know, the planning profession and local governments in general, you know, share the same interests that the business community has, attractive communities attract business. Uh, our legislation does require some specific content directly related to uh, areas of the, uh, the economy, including sort of the residential, commercial, industrial, and agricultural recreation and, and public sectors. If you could just advance the slides. So at the regional scale, we have a tool called Regional Growth Strategies, and they primarily exist in BC's high growth regions. So east coast of Vancouver Island, the lower mainland Squamish Lillard area, the what we call, I guess, the Okanagan Basin, the three Okanagan regional districts, and Thompson Nicola. And the legislation was established in the 1990s uh, to try to give us a, another tool to deal with sprawl and to try to get higher density um, more development around sort of urban core transit. It's a, a framework that enables the municipalities and the regional district to develop a joint regional plan. It does have a required content around economic development. 
and regional growth strategies in most regions have also spun off regional economic development strategies. So if you're moving into or you're, um, you want to learn more about a region that you're in, uh, if you're in any of those regions that I just mentioned, those areas, you may want to pull up the growth strategy and see what kind of framework it provides for economic development. Next slide, please. Now, the regional growth strategy tool was developed for the high growth parts of British Columbia, and about 80% of our population is covered under a regional growth strategy in those areas that I talked about. Other parts of the province, it's not really an appropriate tool. We've got communities that are a little bit more uh, dispersely settled, and even though there's, there may be growth, it's not the kind of growth that really requires strong coordination between adjacent communities. But that doesn't stop regional districts from developing other regional strategies. Uh, the one up on the screen here is from the Caribou Regional District. So there are other tools that regions can use this to work on strategies related to particular sectors. Uh, so it might be um, agriculture, maybe in the North North Squamish, or related to growth in uh, or agriculture sector in Pemberton. Tourism, maybe in the Kootenays parks, and these all support economic development. Next slide, please. At the local scale, uh, across the entire province, communities, local governments, um, typically have what's called an official community plan. Many of you have probably dealt with it. Official community plans can be, are used typically by municipalities and regional districts in electoral areas to map out and plan for growth. Uh, they're not, even though they're pretty much cover off the entire province, they're not, they're not actually mandated. There isn't any timelines, but typically communities develop these and they, and they go through probably a five-year cycle of, of amending them. In the higher growth regions, they may need to that, do that more often. Again, they include economic development, uh, vision statements. I have found them quite interesting over the years to read as usually there's a lot of history and a lot of background. So if you have, if you are a business owner or you know somebody who's moving into a particular community, pulling up the OCP and having a look at it gives you not only sort of a sense of where the zoning and where the preferred land uses are located, it also has got some interesting history on the background of the community and more and more also including more First Nations context. Um, I guess the last thing I'll say on that, aside from a very few, we province does not approve these as opposed to other other places in British in, in Canada. So they're very much developed um, at the local level. Next slide, please. Um, just one, I guess, getting close to the end here. We appreciate in that in terms of moving development forward and rezoning, that process can take a lot of time, effort, can add cost to doing business. So the ministry did a collaborative process to look at the development review process, and that's currently currently continuing to be underway, and there's a report available. It's, it's tricky because you have to go back to the principles we talked about in terms of local autonomy. So we're hesitant to sort of impose new systems, but we are encouraging local governments to find ways to look at their, their process for development approvals, uh, make it as transparent and, and, and as efficient as possible, keeping in mind, of course, that whenever you talk about um, a change in zoning or a change in use or an increase in density, uh, you're going to want to involve the community, and that could take some time and process and conversation. Next slide, please. Won't say too much about this, but you know, generally when it comes to land use planning, your what we talk about in terms of your your overarching documents or your OCP and your growth strategies, but then you get into other bylaws which implement those zoning, subdivision subdivision standard approvals, service agreements. We also have what's called phase development agreements in BC. Something that was introduced a few years ago, really, in those situations where council or a board and a developer want to enter into um, a project that has it's going to take a lot of time to build out and in 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 providing the zoning there are a number of public benefits that were provided so basically it's something that council and the developer can enter enter into to protect both the zoning and the provision of those of those public elements um, it basically means that for a period of time council or a board can't come back and change the zoning and for those agreements that are over 10 years in length, up to 20 maximum, 
uh, the inspector of municipalities has to approve is to provide that oversight. And I'm not sure that might be it. Do we have one more slide maybe to wrap up on planning? Where of it? Oh. Doesn't look like it Sorry, might can you go, go into yes, the can you go there, there we go. So Catherine on this on the whole material that she covered is available. Um, I currently don't work in the planning and land use branch at this point in time, but we know all our colleagues there. So if you have any questions about planning, happy, happy to be a resource for you. Thank you. I guess it's back to Jessica. Great, thank you guys both so much. Um, I know that this slide deck has a number of resources as well for um, people to, to be able to look at. So you'll be able to see um, links and more information when you go online. Um, I, uh, we have Emmanuel who's going to be presenting next, but we just have one question that came in for the, the last group. So the um, section 14 of the community charter allows for two or more municipalities to in establish an intermunicipal scheme. We in Kamloops are in the process of implementing an inter-community business license, license program with the community, communities around us. This also includes our neighboring First Nations communities. Does this section permit us to partner with uh, the First Nations communities or do we need to obtain a special legal agreement to do this? So that question's for right. Catherine. It's Cap, it's Cap, can you hear me? Is Catherine here? Yeah, but you sound great. Great. Um, no, there there is a section in the community charter. I think I touched on it briefly in the slide about partnerships, local government par partnerships with First Nations. I want to say it's section 21 of the community charter, but don't quote me on that, um, that allows local governments to create um, partnership agreements with First Nations as as well. Does that does that answer? Great. So if, the, if you need more information from Catherine on that, the person who asked the question, just follow up with her directly um, and she'll be able to provide any any information that's that's not covered by that. I think we have time for one more question, if you'll just um, bear with me here. Um, is there additional information about these tools online and where might it, where might the information be found? Uh, yeah, at the end of the presentation there, there's a, a resources section. So, um, and it links to a lot of um, the information that is on our, our government website. Yeah, there it is. Um, so a lot of the information is, is there. Um, but again, if, if there's something very specific that doesn't happen to be on, on those those links, uh, feel free to, to reach out to me and I can either direct you to a resource or, or, or just answer a question. Fantastic. Well, thank you again for providing the, um, the presentation and sharing that information. We are going to be moving on to the town of Gibsons. So I'd like to hand this over to Emmanuel Machado, the Chief Administrative Officer, and he's going to be seek, speaking about some of the successes that they've experienced. experienced. Okay, can you hear me now? Very yeah, good? That's great. Okay, great. Good morning again, everyone. Thanks again for the opportunity to be here. I wanted to share with you a little bit of our experience in um, supporting small business and uh, happy small business week to meet small business owners uh, in, in your communities. And in Gibson, certainly. Uh, the economic engine of our community is, is primarily uh, provided by local business and we're highly aware of that. We want to do everything we can to support them. What I wanted to share with you is what types of uh, initiatives we've taken uh, to support our local business and uh, follows a lot of the advice that we've, uh, and support that we've had from, from the province and, and others as well. The, so 
we started by sort of uh, getting our house in order. Uh, not that our house was terribly out of order, but I think in the spirit of continuous improvement, um, we, uh, working with the community, went through a process of updating uh, strategic plans and official community plans and other types of policies, uh, including business license and so on. So I'll share a little bit about that with you. We, uh, in general, are the other aspect of it was around financial sustainability, not that uh, we have a lot of sort of funds to directly um, you know, support initiatives, but we thought that uh, how we price utilities, for example, that to make sure that we're collecting enough revenues to provide these critical services. Um, it's been um, a lot of effort, uh, but at the same time, the community has responded with support in light of uh, seeing the reliability of the services that we provide. Uh, also, in terms of land and leases, both water leases and land leases of property, uh, we've been reviewing those to make sure that uh, as a community, uh, uh, we're getting fair value for, for the community's investments as well. And we've been pursuing um, in an effort to go beyond uh, just taxation powers Try to find other forms of revenue, and I think that for small places like Gibson's, a community forest agreement could make a, a difference in our lives. And so we've been for the last uh, last while engaging with with the ministry and others, and to see about the possibility of doing that. Of course, you know we're uh, the beachcomber is still very much part of our brand, and um, but at the same time, the community is is evolving, and we um, have been trying to sort of uh, demonstrate uh, the type of community we are today. Uh, natural asset management, interestingly enough, it's, it's put us a little bit on the map just because of our efforts to um, meaningfully incorporate natural capital considerations into the town's planning and operations and decision making as well. So we're, we're delivering services to our community uh, at a, with a much higher environmental uh, benefits uh, because we're investing in a lot of these natural areas and that um, uh, also is good for, for, our, for our brand and for uh, our livability. Our, you know, uh, the arrival of our breweries and other types of businesses that require uh, good water and, and sewer capacity as well Certainly, it was timely because the town of Gibson uh, has seen a, a growth in that area, and uh, so we've got uh, several breweries that um, rely on our water, and uh, we've had to make some adjustments in our sewer capacity as well, and we've got uh, plenty of both uh, to support them. Um, in terms of other infrastructure, since 2015, we're, we've had fiber to every property on the Sunshine Coast, and Gibson's in particular. And we're very thankful for the investments that um, a corporation like TELUS has made, and that are really it was a fundamental part of our of our recent growth because we've seen um, individuals and organizations that had to go to the mainland, go to Vancouver uh, just to uh, you know participate in, in, in the tech sector, and now we can do it from here thanks to uh, the availability of fiber. And as Brent was mentioning a little bit earlier, we have certainly reviewed and improved our uh, timelines of our of our uh, planning and development processes, um, being re as realistic as possible, and keeping in mind that um, these investments that people make are considerable, and um, at the same time, we have responsibilities uh, to uh, adequately plan and be open and transparent with these decisions as well. One of the ways internally that we've done that is by, you know, really moving away from having a series of departments interact with development and set up internal teams that uh, view it on behalf of the town. And we're seeing those improvements being based on sort of that approach um, as well. We have been part of the asset management work that we've been doing. We've been trying to make a better coordination between what we ask the development community to build and from a these growing areas that we have, and our ability to maintain those assets afterwards as well. So we uh, have amended our, our subdivision standards bylaw, 
uh, to better align with, with our ability to maintain that. In Sunshine Coast, although we're a collection of communities, uh, increasingly and more uh, so than we've seen in the past, we're working as a team, and that's been uh, very refreshing. Um, we've got great examples in Sunshine Coast tourism. Uh, the last three years, we've benefited from uh, a recent MRDT. There was many years of work to put that together. Um, and we have a better coordinated message. And we've seen the growth in tourism very uh, substantial and very con uh, consecutive over the last few years. Um, the Sunshine Coast uh, Regional Economic Development Organization is another example of a uh, regional approach, in this case to economic development. And uh, there are, we're, they're not all completed, but there's a series of work hubs uh, that are creating um, very good opportunities for startups and others. Uh, the coordination of data and, and capacity and uh, managing our brand uh, a lot better as well. Uh, the political leadership has been very uh, uh, very supportive of, as well. Is at the moment uh, there are regional housing studies, child care plans, and water governance uh, work uh, projects in the works. Uh, there are with a view of providing the best service we can to as a region, rather than just. Um, silo into our own respective communities. But uh, three years ago, we moved into a mobile business license approach, and so that uh, we recognize other communities' business licenses, and they do the same. And so we're uh, trying to be a lot more business friendly. And that also includes um, the Shishout Nation uh, businesses that uh, are recognized here as well. And so. Um, it's no surprise that we've seen uh, the number of business licenses go up, which is somewhat counterintuitive, and our revenues, funny enough as well, uh, go up. And um, so that, uh, I think we've heard from local businesses that are facilitating uh, that has been uh, very well received by them. I think we're talking about the value of partnerships. We, uh, the Gibson Sparbuck market um, has, uh, been a major anchor to uh, Lower Gibson's. Uh, it followed uh, a regional study for on, on to try to find better opportunities for local agriculture, but it turned out to be so much more than that. Um, we wanted to participate in that and support. Um, and from the beginning, council had some principles that they wanted to sort of follow, uh, including uh, avoiding sort of inherent. Uh, inheriting uh, any additional or any debt obligations for that matter, and also uh, not uh, recognizing that we wouldn't have had the capacity to uh, financially support the operations either. Uh, so with those things in mind, um, ultimately after considering you know, a municipal corporation approach or even a C3 corporation, um, what we determined that considering the organization that's there and to meet their needs and ours, that a non-for-profit society um, operates under a service agreement. And we are, in essence, uh, our role uh, at this stage is we own 39% of the assets, and uh, where necessary, we've provided charitable tax uh, receipts for uh, donations um, as well. And uh, the market is... Um, is doing very well. It's uh, like any new business; it's uh, you know it's a challenge to get going, but uh, uh, the community has responded uh, very strongly in terms of, of the support that they show. And um, it's not insignificant to what's been created there in terms of jobs. So we've got 52 new jobs uh, in counting. We've got eight new businesses and other startups that have even come from those. And because of uh, you know, the, the activity uh, that uh, the facility says, the first year about 80,000 visitors came through to that place. And so um, the, it's just, the market is just one of other, uh, you know, positive uh, developments in Lower Gibsons and Upper Gibsons for that matter. Uh, we were interested in understanding, um, you know, the interaction between Lower Gibsons, sort of the business area, uh, and um, the harbor which um, we had never really fully um, appreciated, perhaps. Um, but there are over 400 direct and indirect jobs in the, in the mix of 
nearly 50 businesses that operate uh, out of the harbor. And uh, together they, um, in 2017, uh, raised over uh, $49 million in revenues. And so we think there's, that shows potential for the growth of you know, boat repair business and transportation related, uh, marine transportation and uh, also recreation. Since 2017, we've had, um, by the end of 2018, I should say, we had 185 new businesses that had, uh, in addition to what we had before, uh, have, um, have taken a license in Gibsons. And uh, from what I understand, 2019, uh, we're expected to surpass that number. Uh, we've also had you know, the busiest uh, development year in, in our history last year, and certainly uh, are on track to, to have another solid one, although don't expect to be to, to the same level. Certainly for us, participating in, in the small business BC is, uh, it's been very, uh, uh, very helpful. Um, like every other community, we sometimes we're all very busy just doing the work, but uh, I'm glad we took some time to, to work with uh, small business BC and uh, uh, in terms of uh, the recognition and the pride that has brought us, uh, having the validation that uh, has come from um, having others looking at uh, what we're doing and, and giving us a thumbs up in this case. Uh, learning from other communities that um, have gone down this road and um, I feel that uh, this is perhaps reassuring for our local businesses that uh, we're doing what we can to support them. So that, um, I'll leave it there for now and I see if there's any questions that uh, you want to, to ask and uh, thanks again. Great, thank you so much, Emmanuel. We have had a couple of questions come in um, and we have a little bit of time now. So the first question is, is um, what is the structure of SCREDO? Who is partnering and where does the funding come from? So uh, SCREDO for us <laughs> uh, is funded by uh, local governments, the, the district of Seashell, the Sunshine Coast Regional District, also the Shishout Nation and the town of Gibsons. Uh, they have an annual budget of around $300,000. And they are in essence a society and they are, uh, they have an independent board uh, and operated under a service agreement for, for the funding part. Um, we have another question here. Um, do you think that the lower housing costs in your area have an impact on people in the business that are businesses that are locating there? And have you had any issues attracting employees for those businesses? Lower housing costs is all relative. If you're starting up, uh, you know, as a young person, uh, it's very difficult to afford a house here. Um, rents have gone through the roof. It's been quite challenging. And even larger employers uh, have a challenge uh, maintaining employees because of the cost of housing. Um, of course, uh, between you know foreign buyers taxes and other types of, of, uh, of, of measures, we've seen sort of uh, an increased interest over the last couple of years in, in moving to the Sunshine Coast. And I, if you have assets in other areas that have a higher value, it's uh, certainly attractive to move here. Um, so we're, we're working our way through it. Um, there's challenges in terms of uh, uh, finding sufficiently, uh, mostly related to the affordability or rather than the quantity of houses. Um, there's a lot of housing projects that are approved, uh, but not yet fully built. So over the next couple of years, we're, we're hoping to see some improvements there. Great. And then just kind of one final question. Um, the new businesses that are being opened, are they typically by people already living in the community? Or are they new businesses coming from outside of the community? A lot of them are new, um, but over half of them are home based. And again, you know, speaks to the value of the fiber optic. Um, just a lot of business to business as well. Not so much storefront based. But I think that trend is, uh, we're seeing that in other aspects as well, you know, people with home deliveries and all types of other implications for what's happening with retail overall. 
Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing this, your time and the successes that you've been having um, in Gibson's and kind of some of the approaches that you guys have been taking. Um, uh, right now, I'm going to switch over to our final presenter for today. So um, if you'll just bear with us, we'll just try and switch back. Great, so now I'd like to welcome Sue Adams. She's a member of the Small Business Roundtable, and um, she'd like to speak to you about the Open for Business Awards. Sorry, Sue, I think you might be muted. You, it looks like you're unmuted now. Do you wanna give it a try? Yep, yes, I think maybe you had unmuted me. Can you hear me? Yeah, you sound great. Okay, very good. Um, well, thank you very much, um, and what a pleasure it is to, uh, for me to um, have the opportunity to program was established by the Small Business Roundtable in 2011 to recognize and promote BC communities that have implemented leading business-friendly policies and initiatives to attract, retain, and help small business. Over the past two years, um, the committee and the staff have worked very hard to review and renew the whole program so that it's much easier for communities of any size to participate. The Small Business Roundtable have partnered with Small Business BC and their awards gala. Many of you would have attended this fabulous event and would be well aware of the celebration of excellence and the recognition and promotion the winners received, not only on the night, but long, uh, long after the event is over. And Emmanuel, thank you very much for the pitch as uh, one of the uh, recipients of the award last year. The vision of the Open for Business Awards program is that all communities across BC, large, small, rural, urban, First Nations are open for business. So the purpose is really um, two-pronged to inspire communities of all size, sizes to learn from their peers and adopt and implement initiatives that support small business. Secondly, to recognize local governments and First Nations that their organizations have implemented exceptional um, open for business initiatives. So what's in it for your community? We heard again the pitch from Emmanuel from Gibson's. It provides an opportunity to review what you've accomplished over the last while and to share your accomplishments. So it's always good, um, a great opportunity and great value in self-evaluation self of the programs that you're currently operating. It provides a great opportunity for you to tell business community, to tell your business community that you're open for business. Finalists in each of the categories receive two complimentary tickets to the small business BC Awards Gala, which will be held in February, where the winners are announced. And as I said before, it's a magnificent evening with excellent opportunity to network and create awareness for your particular community. Winning communities proudly display the Open for Business logo. Again, you saw Gibson's open their presentation today with the recognition that they were a recipient. And so that logo you can use in promotional materials as a testament to the Open for Business culture entrepreneurs and business owners will find in your community. Videotapes are developed for finalists and these can be used in future promotions for your community. Two years ago, uh, I chatted with the mayor of Kimberley after he had, he had accepted the award on behalf of his community and he commented, wow, if I'd known what a fabulous event this was and the number and variety of business people are in the room, and the opportunity the award provides to attract businesses to our area, I would have made a big pitch um, to move to Kimberley in my acceptance speech. And so there's lots of value in participating in this program. Um, and uh, it's actually really easy to nominate. Um, and I think Jessica has another sl slide on the timeline. Um, you can follow the steps in the best business guide uh, which I believe you all have a copy of. And we've made the submission process much easier too. Perhaps not all that easier for the adjudication uh, process. The committee does take the process very seriously. Evaluations are guided by seven best uh, practices highlighted in the um, guide. Um, so there you can notice on your screen the um, timeline. Um, and by using this slide and uh, the, the best practices guide, 
And it's also laid out, the process is laid out very clearly on the website. And of course, um, the small business department are happy to help you with that. A special note, um, I just had an update from the branch. We were sitting at 60 nominations already, but I understand um, from this morning that um, there are now 65 nominations. And this is, uh, this is a fantastic response. And another reminder is that your uh, submissions are active for three years. So you can amend or enhance uh, a previous case study that you may have um, presented. Um, it still qualifies for um, consideration in the, in the awards this coming year. Um, so if you haven't before, uh, if you haven't nominated already, um, and remember small, medium or large communities are eligible, we urge you to do so now. You still have a month. And the small and reminder that the small business branch is there to help you. So as chair of the committee, I look forward very much to reading your submissions. And thank you for this opportunity to promote and good luck. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Sue, for sharing that information with our group. Um, I hope everyone takes some time to think about nominating their community and has a look on their website. Um, there will be um, a link to that information when we post the webinar video as well. Um, just to follow up, um, we will be posting this recording. Um, I will uh, try to do some edits because this, as you all are aware, wasn't the most technically smooth uh, webinar that we've ever had, but all the information will be posted with those slides and you'll have access to that um, in about a week on our website. Um, I, I would like to let you know that we have another web, webinar that we, are, we do have coming up that you may be interested in. Uh, we are going to be do, providing um, a, a webinar that provides insights on the small scale licensed cannabis production in BC. So that's going to have presentations from a successful applicant to, uh, for a micro license as well as um, people that are working to support um, the small scale growers in British Columbia through the community futures. Um, and uh, that should be good if you're, if you're a community that has people that are interested in it, you want to know more on um, what to expect, what things look like. Um, it'll be really interesting and really educational in that way. So you can register for that on our website, or if you're already on our distribution list, you would have got an email for that um, last week. Um, and that's all from us. Thank you so much. I don't see any new questions that have come in, um, but if you do have any, we will um, pass them on to our presenters and uh, follow up with you if, uh, if you, they haven't already been answered. So thank you again for taking the time to join us today, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. Thanks, Jessica.